Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Bill. Hey, do me a favor. Look at the person beside you and say, you really sang well this morning. Now, the person on the other side, who's your second choice, look at them and make them feel really good. Look at them and say, you look like you've lost some weight this morning, all right? Make them feel really good. That helps, man. After 4th of July celebrations, that's always good. Good morning. Like, uh, like uh, the, uh, Pastor Bill said, my name is Scott uh, Dawson. I'm, we're here almost every year, and we love Lenexa Baptist Church. You don't know how much you just, um, you, you have blessed me, my family, the ministry we lead, and uh, we were here for the Faith and Family Day at Kauffman Stadium. It was our 13th year, and so Cleveland decided to score a run for every year we've conducted Faith and Family. So uh, it was not a, not a good turnout for the baseball, but last night they're estimating over 40% of the attendance stayed for the Faith and Family event with Crowder, and we registered over 180 decisions for Jesus Christ last night. So thank y'all so much. Uh, it, this, I'm just going to tell you, it would probably not have happened without the partnership with, of Lenexa Baptist Church. Thank you all for being leaders, not only abroad, but right here where you live. And just thank you from the bottom of our heart. We love your pastor, uh, the staff, uh, and you know, it's been a tough couple of years. We've been through this pandemic. Barna has said that six out of ten pastors considered quitting during the pandemic. My statement is the other four were just lying, amen? Okay, so uh, it has been a tough, tough time. So thank you for your staff, Pastor Bill, Jim, Pastor Jim, Steve, man, St I mean, just goes on and on around. We got everybody here at the front, Kelly, and just, um, can we honor your staff this morning? I know they're all over the place, but thank y'all so much. Uh, man, it's so good. It's so good to be here because we, we go home to Alabama that, that you know, it's not a, it's not a foreign land. It's, it's part of the United States. Uh, and we go home and we talk. We talk about Lenexa. We just love your church. We also talk about your food. We do love your food. We, we come from a place, we, we're good, kind of good foodies, but we love your food in Kansas City. So uh, we talk about all that, but we also talk about what God does every time we're here. His hand is just hover, hovering all over y'all, and thank y'all uh, for all you do. Uh, you know, in the Old Testament, when the people got together, they anticipated God to speak. So I know the pastor's away, but I, I just got to ask you, did you expect God to speak? When, are you anticipating God to speak? And I'll go one step further. When they all got together, they had anticipated their response. You think about that, how we do church in America today. Did we come in here thinking that God was going to speak? And if he spoke, were we anticipating our response to him? Because it's in that type of anticipation we approach God's word. So I want to ask you if you brought your Bible to open up with me to the book of 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, as you probably know, that was written by the Apostle Paul to a young man named Timothy. Now Paul, if you read his life account, you know early in Scripture, in the book of Acts, he was called Saul, Saul of Tarsus. And Saul of Tarsus, he was an antagonist to the church. He wanted to stomp out Christianity. In fact, if you were to read the account of the first martyr of the church, Stephen, Paul, uh, Saul was the one who condoned his death. They, they came and they laid their cloaks at the feet of this man named Saul. Now, later on, when Saul met Jesus, Jesus became so much more than just an addition to his life. Jesus became the transformation of his life. And all of a sudden, Saul knew he'd experienced the real thing, and he's being called the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary the world's ever seen. And so, in the book of 2 Timothy, he's writing to his young protege. And I want you to see what he says in verse, two, verse 1 of 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, now, Timothy, you therefore be my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I want you to see there's the law of replication. He is saying, I, as I have entrusted it to you, you entrust it to others. I always say there's three types of Christians. There's the remember when Christian. And that's the one that's always thinking it was better 20 years ago, okay? Remember when. Remember when. 
And then in today's society, there's a lot of remember me Christians. The remember me Christians are the ones that we just want to be fat and happy, okay? It's all about serving me. But then there, is a, there are a few, the remnant, who's the remember why Christians. Why are we here? It is always, we thank the Lord for the generation that's come before us, but we're always looking for the generation behind us so that we can pass the baton on to them. So I'm praying every one of us in this room, you, you have a Paul in your life. You have someone that's more seasoned, a, a, a veteran of the faith that's building into you, but you've also in your life found a Timothy that you can pour into as the principle of replication. So as Paul gives us this, then he gives us an incredible illustration. Look down in verse 3. He says, now, Timothy, you therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. I want you to underscore the phrase, good soldier. He says, no one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, to, today, I, I was thinking, you know, we just got through Independence Day. We celebrated the, 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 the birth of our country, and we're so thankful for the men and women who have served in our armed forces. I, I, I believe that one of the greatest tragedies of today is we've forgotten the cost of freedom. We just think we're entitled to it, but it came at a specific cost. In fact, if you're a man or a woman that served or serves in our armed forces, I, I know you had this last week, but would you, would you just raise your hand right now? If you've served in our armed forces, can we honor these individuals today? Thank y'all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Some. Some groups get an entire month to celebrate. I, I think y'all need the entire year to celebrate y'all. And I'll go one step further. I think the, one of the tragedies of the church of our country is we've forgotten the cost of freedom for us. That we just think it's entitled, but it cost Jesus his life. I said last night, Kaufman Stadium, God loved us so much he'd rather die than to live without us. What a tremendous cost that was, that was placed on him on the cross so that you and I can have freedom in Christ. So as Paul is talking to young Timothy, he talks about being a good soldier. And I started thinking about that phrase, what makes a good soldier? I think, I think there would probably be four parts of making a good soldier. If we could have a, a man or a woman that walked up on this platform dressed in uniform and we had a discussion with this person I believe we could get some incredible analogies in the Christian faith. Because the first aspect of being a good soldier is you've got to make it personal. That, that's how, how do you become a soldier? If you were to ask any of these men or women who raised their hands and served at our armed forces, what would it do to us if they looked at us and said, well, I never became a soldier. I was always, I was always a soldier. And I, in my mind, I'm thinking you were placed in your playpen and you had camouflage diapers on, you know, and all that kind of, you say, it doesn't happen like that. Well, what if they were to say, well, I moved within 20, 25 miles of a, of a training base and that U-Haul was unloaded and that's how I became a soldier. They you say, it doesn't happen like that. They'd say, oh, you don't understand. My dad's a soldier. My grandfather's a soldier. All my family's a soldier, so it just makes sense that I'm a soldier. Doesn't happen like that. I believe if you were to ask any one of these men and women, the moment in time when they became a, a soldier, it was when they took the oath of allegiance. It was in front of their recruiting officer, their drilling instructor. They always had to raise their right hand, and they repeated that oath, and they got to the end of it, and they said, so help me God. And as soon as those words come forth from their lips into the ears of that recruiting officer, in the eyes of the military, they're now a soldier. Now, you could be sitting here going, Scott, they've never fought in a war. Fighting in a war is not a requirement to be a soldier. You can say they ain't even got their uniform on. Getting a uniform is not the requirement for being a soldier. You must take the oath of allegiance. Now, I'm not up here today to recruit you to our armed forces, but I'm telling you this, as I travel this country and I start sharing my faith and I start talking about people about a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you're going to be surprised at this. 
but an overwhelming majority of people in our country will say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. And that's when it becomes fun. Because my next question is, well, when did you become a Christian? How did you become a follower of Christ? And that's when I get all kinds of answers. I've had people look at me and say, well, I've never, been a, I've never become a Christian. I, I've always been a Christian. You could be sitting here this morning going, Scott, I've never become a Christian. I, I've always been a Christian. And my mind's a little weird, and so I'm thinking you were placed in the playpen, and your first words were, praise God, you know? And I go, that doesn't happen. Like, in fact, I'm going to go ahead and tell y'all something. Y'all don't know this, but Tara and I, we have found out that Hunter and Shannon, they're, they're going to have a baby. We're going to be grandparents. I mean, that's good news. Now, I want to tell you that's good news, all right? So, Tara, she's Southern. She's got a great picked out grandparent name. She's going to be called Sweet Tea. Isn't that good? Sweet Tea. I, I do student conferences. We'll have 10,000 students. It's hard for me to have a, 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 a toddler come running up and say, hey, Grandpa, so I picked out a grandfather name. I want to be called Mixmaster Scotty D, okay? I think that would be a, a perfect name. Now, you and I both know I'll be called whatever that kid wants to call me. That's how it works. But I, I th I, Tara and I have talked about this. When someone says children will change your life, is that not the greatest understatement of the planet. Y'all don't even understand what's about to take place. I've been preaching since I was a teenager. I had a sermon entitled, 10 Surefire Ways to get, Raise Godly Kids. I had no business preaching that message. I didn't have any kids. If I preached it today, my sermon would be entitled, Three Suggestions That May or May Not Work, okay? <laughs> That's the difference between theory and reality, okay? The reality is we come into this world knowing how to be bad. The Bible says that there is a sin nature, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I'm just saying that if you're sitting here this morning going, Scott, I've always been a Christian. I don't want to argue with you, but I want to bring you to Scripture to say, Scripture says you have to become a Christian. Jesus met a religious person in John chapter 3, a man named Nicodemus, and he has one question for Jesus. Nicodemus says, how can a man be born again? And Jesus says, now Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh is flesh, that which is born of spirit spirit is spirit, and here is what he says, you must be born again. So if you're here this morning and there's never been a life-changing part of your life with Jesus, the Bible says you're not born a Christian, you have to become a Christian. When I'm sharing my faith like that, people go, oh, okay, I joined the church. Look at me, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not asking you when you join the church. And they'll say, well, I was baptized, I'm not asking you when you were baptized. And then in the South, they get a little irritated, and they'll go, well, you better watch it. My uncle's a preacher. I believe everybody in the South has somebody in their family tree who's a preacher. I don't know how it is up here. I did it in the first service. I was pretty shocked, but I'm going to ask you, how many of you, you have someone in your family tree who's a preacher? Let me see your hands. Wow, that's the same thing in the first. Y'all are just like Southerners. I'm going to tell you, look at me. If you're trying to get to heaven on the coattails of an uncle who's a prayer, I'm going to go one step further. Just because your parents are a Christian, it doesn't make you a Christian. Just like if you were born in Baskin Robbins, it doesn't make you a flavor of the month. You know what I'm saying? All right? There's got to be something personal inside your life. And I think if you were to ask any one of us inside this room who knows Jesus personally, it's not about Jesus. It's not an accumulation of facts of Jesus, if you're sitting in this room and all you got is head knowledge, I want you to understand, I don't want to offend you, but the Bible teaches us that the demons in the pit of hell recognize there's a God. They know that Jesus died on the cross. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make us religious. Jesus died on the cross to make us righteous. And it's about time for us to understand the gospel's not about bad people becoming good. The gospel's about dead people coming alive in Jesus. I like, I like clapping. Okay, so hey, here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're sitting here this morning and you know Jesus, you know the moment in time when you went from being a, away from Christ to being in Christ, it's when we took the oath. 
Now, that oath is not done out of duty. Duty means, you know, I've got to do this. It's not out of obligation. I ought to do this. It's done out of privilege. It's understanding that when Jesus went to the cross, behind that screen is the icon of the cross. When Jesus went to the cross, he paid the penalty of my sin. He paid the price of your sin. The Bible says God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. And it's when my spirit cries, out, God, I'm apart from you. I need you. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. As soon as that prayer is prayed, not from your lips, but from your heart, it is transported straight to the throne room of God. And in the eyes of the Almighty, you're now a follower of Jesus Christ. You've got to take the oath. It's got to be personal to you. It's not a religious thing. It's not a societal thing. It is when you make it personal. I got got a question for you. Is Jesus personal in your life? If not, this morning, cross the line. That's how you become a good soldier. You make it personal. Now, the second question I got to ask is how do you make it public? Have you ever thought about this? How does a soldier, a good soldier, make it public? I I, I think he or she would say, "I, I, I wear my uniform." Because when you receive the uniform, I had a commanding officer tell me this one time. He says, Scott, do you understand when a soldier takes their uniform, that is the first command they obey. They take their uniform. I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. Because God loves us so much, he gave us a uniform. Now, a uniform is a Latin word. I'm going to teach you something. Una means one, one form. That means there is only one form, one uniform. No one walks down the assembly line and says, I don't like the military green. Give me the yellow striped one, okay? It doesn't happen like that. Everybody has to get the same uniform. You represent the battalion. Now, what I'm going to talk to you about is how to be a good soldier for Jesus. You wear the uniform. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about believer's baptism. Now, when I talk about believer's baptism, I'm saying that, I, I, look, I'm not, I'm not talking about infant baptism services. Uh, Tara and I, we've been to several infant baptismal services, and they're mer- very, very meaningful to the parents. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about once a person understands they're apart from Christ, always this process in Scripture, you are convicted of your sin, you are converted from your sin, and then you go through the believer's baptismal process. Now, when I'm talking about baptism, I'm talking about putting on the uniform. It is representing the entire battalion, okay? It is when you take that uniform, you represent the cause of Christ, and you could be sitting here going, what, what's so big about, about baptism? It's because we're under the authority of Christ. Now, I've got to remind you, baptism does not save you. Jesus saves you. Anybody can go out and rent a uniform. That doesn't make you a soldier, but here's the difference. Every soldier will wear the uniform. And if you're inside this room going, Scott, I, I, you don't understand my situation. I have a fear of water. Some that may be silly, but I understand that's a real fear. But I want you to understand how I'm bound. I can't stand up here on this platform and talk about a God that's so powerful that he can bring life back from the grave that I can't stand up here in the same breath to say that our God is so powerful that somehow, some way, he'll give you the boldness to walk through the believer's baptism. I mean, if people say, well, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized, I guarantee if he had a chance to, he would have. It is being under the authority of Christ. And you may be sitting there going, well, why, what's the big deal about I believe there's a huge deal about baptism. Because I know there's hundreds of reasons. If Pastor Chad was here, he could preach a six-week sermon series on why you need to be baptized. I'm going to give you the 30,000 simple-minded look. I'm ADD, so here it goes, three of them. Number one, it is the definition of the word. The word baptized does mean to immerse. We're not saying other people are wrong. We want to be authentic to the word of God. So we do go through believers' baptism of immersion. The second, it is the intention of the word. If you think about this, when Jesus died on the cross, where did they place his body? The tomb. When you go underneath the water, that is your testimony to this world. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So it's the definition of the word. It is the intention of the word. I'm going to give you the third reason. It is for inspiration. Because what happened on the third day? He arose. That's the reason we don't leave you underneath the water. Amen? All right? So you come up out of this water, and it's your testimony of this world. I have been crucified with Christ. Christ lives in me. Me, there's nothing to fear about going through baptism. It is your testimony. I'm putting on the test, uh, the uniform of Christ. Now, uh, I, I, can you have fun in church? Can you have fun in church? 
never miss a baptismal service. I love them when I was, I mean, I'm telling you, we used to do them on Sunday nights when I was at Roebuck Park Baptist in Birmingham. And our pastor, Doug Sager, one night, he was going to baptize this lady. I, I promise you that I saw it. It was, <laughs> when, when he got this side down, that side came up. It was a work of art. I pro you know what he did? He went, whoop, whoop, just like that. Got it right. So, some of you out there are like, man, I would get baptized. I ain't doing it now. <laughs> Scared. Well, if something happens, you know where you're going. Amen? So it's all right. So don't, there, there's nothing to worry about. Can you have fun in church? I want you to zone in. We can have fun all day long. But I don't want you to overstep the seriousness of baptism. It doesn't save you but it puts you under the authority of Christ. So some are maybe here this morning, you know Jesus, you've taken the oath and you've thought about being baptized, but in just a few moments when we have time of invitation, I'm gonna ask you to step out and come forward, grab this hand and say, you know what, I'm gonna be accountable for this decision. I'm gonna go through believer's baptism. So we know how you make it personal. We know how you, how you make it public. The, the third statement, I think, to be a good soldier is you gotta make it productive. A soldier doesn't go down the assembly line, get his uniform, get the, get, the, get the weapon, and look at his commanding officer and say, if y'all ever go to war, give me a call. I'm going back home. It doesn't happen like that. You got to go to boot camp. Because when you go to boot camp, you know what you learn? You learn how to be a soldier. Because if you're a soldier, you got to learn how to march. You got you to learn how to use your weapon. But a soldier understands if you're out there in the war, you got to know who's got your back. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand, you're in boot camp right now. There's a training base that meets every Sunday morning. Man, sometimes you got extra training. You, you need to be a part of a local congregation. I'm leery of anyone who's not part of a local congregation. I'm going to tell you, Tara and I, if I'm not preaching, uh, our whole family, we're all going to church together now. Yeah, that just happened. So we, we're all together. Uh, if I'm not pre we're there. There is no other game in town. God loved the church so much he died for her. And you know what I've realized? I, I walk inside some churches and I'll go, man, are you a member here? And they'll go, oh, no, I, we're just visiting. I'll go, how long have you been visiting? Well, about three years. Can I, can, it's time for y'all to lean in. Because some of you have been here and, and, and y'all don't have any plants. Usually y'all have all kinds of plants up here. Y'all don't have, they, uh, this illustration would have worked really well if they'd had plants up here. So you got to use your mind with me right now, okay? You know the difference between potted plants and planted plants? The depth of the roots. And you know what I've noticed in this society? We got a lot of potted plant Christians they're so mobile, they'll go over here and they'll experience what's happening over here and then they'll just pick themselves up and they'll go over here and they'll experience what's going on and they're just church hopping. Look, look at me. I believe I know your pastor's heart to the point I can say this. If this is not the place where God's called you, find it and get plugged in. But if God's calling you here, ladies and gentlemen, get plugged in. Lean into this. Go through the next steps. Understand that it takes something, accountability. In just a few moments when we stand, some need to step out and go, man, I, I just need to get plugged in here. I, I, I don't know where God's calling me. I don't know where my ministry's going to be. Maybe I need to go through a spiritual gifts test. Maybe I need to go through that uh, assimilation class. But I, whatever the Lord wants from us, we want our roots to go deep. Because when your roots go deep, look at me, when the storms come, you're able to withstand and uh, if you're watching online, we thank God for those who are online. And if you can't come, please continue to watch online. But if you're watching online and you, and you can go to Walmart, you can come to church. Amen. So that's what I'm going to say about that. And by, oh, because I'm about to fend the rest of you right now. So hold on. There's a training base called the Baptist. There's a training base called the Methodist. Training base called the Nazarenes. If you never notice something, the Navy doesn't go up to war against the Marines. The Army doesn't call the Air Force and go, we're, we're, we're going to duke it out last one. Can, can I tell you, some, some of the most ruthless people I know warm pews every single Sunday. Mike Warnke in the 70s had a great statement. He said, the, the Christian Army is the only army that spends all their time either shining their own armor or shooting their own wounded. We're not here for a competition. Because if I was competing against you, I'm very competitive. If I'm playing a senior adult in checkers, I want her crying, okay? I'm sorry, that's just how I am. 
but I'm not competing against you. This is not a competition. Look at me. If you want to know what this is, this is a mash hospital for wounded souls. And if you've been beaten up in this world and you've walked in here and you're hurt and you're wounded, I want you to know you're in a place that will never throw rocks. Jesus always threw threw ropes. And whatever you're going through, man, I'm asking you, would you allow to bear each other's burdens? In just a few moments, for those of you who are discouraged, those of you who are depressed, those of you who are walking through addictions, in just a few moments when we stand, I'm gonna ask you to come. Don't come to me, I can't help you. Come to Jesus. But if you're sitting here this morning, you're going, man, this is so boring. And you think that church is irrelevant into your life. I've got a money back guarantee for you. If you're sitting there and you're not getting anything out of church and you're going, man, I'm thinking about just throwing up my hands and forgetting about this, I'm gonna give you a money back guarantee. If if you show up for the next six months, you're gonna grow up. I've only got one caveat. You can't stay out till 4 a.m. and wake up for the offering and the invitation. But if you walk in here and you bring your Bible, I know many of you have it on your phones. Bring it on your phones if that's what you want to do. But if you'll have a notebook, a 50 cent big pen, and you're taking notes, and maybe there's a boring speaker like Scott before you, and you're going, man, I don't think anything he's saying is relevant, then you go back to 2 Timothy chapter 2 and you start reading these passages. I'm going to tell you, if you allow the Word of God to penetrate your life, it will blow your mind how quickly you're going to grow up in the faith. We're the only army. Look, we've got the greatest, the most powerful weapon in the universe right near, here in our hands. And the tragedy is most of us know more about TikTok than we know about God's word. Use it. We wonder why we're defenseless in this world. We wonder why Satan is just coming in and ravaging society. It's because we do not know the word of God. We have not put up the shield of faith and the prayers of the saints have become void. Ladies and gentlemen, Christianity is not a playground. Christianity is a battleground. So I'm going to tell you the fourth statement is how do you become a good soldier? You make it personal. You you put on the uniform. You make it public. You show up at boot camp. You're productive. But the final question is how do you make it pleasing? You know how you make it pleasing? You obey your commanding officer. When he gives you a command, when they give a command, you do it. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I tell you? You know, can can I just bring to you this? Some of us will say, I just don't understand everything in God's word. Well, I got news for you. Neither do I. But here is a good statement. Let's stop worrying about the things we don't understand. And if we start obeying what we do understand, that's going to get us on the road to the right direction. So this is probably the last time I'll ever speak here. So I I, I hope you'll just listen to this final thing, okay? Heroes, military heroes. I watched Top Gun, Maverick, and I walked out of there going, finally a good movie. We love heroes. You know what heroes are? Ordinary people that do something extraordinary. There's a guy named Lenny Skutnik. You've never heard of Lenny Skutnik. Lenny Skutnik is a hero. I, you don't know his story. You may have forgotten it, but he, 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 was, uh, uh, he worked in the bureaucracy of the D.C. government. Every night he'd come home, but this particular night there was an upcoming blizzard, so they shut down a little bit early. So he was coming home, and as he was driving home, he was coming home the same time Air Florida 90 was lifting off from then Washington National Airport. This happened in 1982. Because Air Florida 90 was not de-iced properly, there was a malfunction and the plane could not rise above the 14th Street Bridge and it crashed into the bridge, fell into the Potomac River. There were 79 people on board. 74 of them perished immediately, but there were five survivors. Well, they knew they were racing against the clock because of the, not only the air temperature being 29 degrees, but it's January in D.C. The water was frigid. So the rescue helicopter hovered above. They threw a lifeline in. Four of the five survivors were able to be uh, 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 elevated and out of the water. There was a stewardess that couldn't grab the lifeline. Hyperthermia was already taking over her body, and everyone was watching what was going on. But Lenny Scugnett did the unthinkable. He jumped off the bridge into the water, He he himself, he couldn't grab the lifeline because of the cold water. So you know what he did? With all of his might, he swam to the shore with his stewardess, saved her life the next day, front page headlines across the nation. 
But just like today, news cycles come and go. Another story popped up, and Lenny was fading into the sunset, except two weeks later, it was a State of the Union address. Then President Reagan was giving his address, and what he had done is he'd kind of shared the story I just shared with you, but he had invited Lenny to come to the State of the Union and sit in the president's box right beside First Lady Nancy Reagan. And as he gave the account of what took place, he then pointed to the president's box, made Lenny stand up, and then, listen to this, for the first time in our nation's history, someone other than the president of the United States received a standing ovation from members of Congress inside our, state, our nation's capital. You go, that's a good story. Well, then I started thinking, not many of us are going to have Congress give us a standing ovation. You may, it could happen, but... Chances are slim. Then I thought about our commander-in-chief. I, I, I thought about commander-in-chief, that the Lord Jesus Christ, and then I couldn't go, help but go back to this passage of Paul writing to Timothy that it goes back to the first martyr of the church, Stephen, that in Acts chapter 6, when he was given the ultimatum, either stand up for Jesus and live or sit down, sit down, hush up and live, he gave them the account of the gospel and just literally got to them. Maybe this was the time when the Bible says that they were pricked to their heart in Acts chapter 7. Maybe this was the moment the Holy Spirit started speaking to this guy named Saul who later was transformed to the Apostle Paul because he didn't hunker down. He stood up for the gospel. And then I got to Acts chapter 7, verse 55. Would you bring that up on the screen? Listen to what it says here. It says, but he, Stephen, being filled with the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand. And then I started thinking about my theology. Theology teaches us throughout Scripture that when Jesus was buried, resurrected, ascended, he ascended to do what? To sit. This is found in Mark. Would you bring up Mark chapter 16? Listen to what it says here. In Mark chapter 16, so then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Matthew gives us account of this. Give us the Matthew verse. It says, Jesus said to him, it is as you said. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. Paul understood this because in the book of Colossians, he also says in Colossians chapter 3, if if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. But it says when Stephen looked up, he saw Jesus standing. As far as I can trace this, and I have done a lot of study to try to figure this stuff out, as far as I can tell, that is the first record of a standing ovation in all of human history. Why? Can't help but believe Jesus said it. Stephen, you gonna stand up for me? I'm gonna stand up for you. And one day I'm gonna stand before Jesus. You're gonna stand before Jesus. Now, if you don't know him, you're gonna be at the great right throne of judgment. You don't wanna be there. And today you need to come and receive Jesus, but every one of us will be before the judgment seat of Christ. I want him standing. I want him clapping. I want him shouting. Not for my accolades. Not for my rewards. It's not out of duty. It's not out of obligation. But out of my love relationship for him, I want to be found faithful that he's going, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Ladies and gentlemen, most of us are like those people on the bridge. We're seeing the chaos of the world, the devastation of our family, the loss of values in our society. And we're looking around going, someone needs to do something. I'm praying for inside this room, there could be one man, one woman, one young man, one young lady that says, I'll get involved. It starts with your friends. It starts with your neighbors. It starts with the people you work at. It starts when you go to Sheridan's, get yourself some custard. Start talking about Jesus wherever we are. This is not a game. This is life. And most of us are going to go to bed tonight dry-eyed why all of Kansas is crying themselves to sleep. May we be found faithful.
And may we be good soldiers. Are you a good soldier? Here's the deal. Did you walk in expecting God to speak to you? Will you have anticipated your response? This is the moment we're going to decide. I know how Americans are. We're going to decide not to decide. There's no neutrality with Jesus. There's no, you're either coming close to him. You think about how powerful the name of Jesus is. You hit your, your thumb with a hammer. I've never heard anybody in America scream out, Oh, Buddha! No. It's the power of Jesus. Look at me. There's no neutrality with Jesus. In just a few moments, you can hide from me. I don't know who's here. But there was a woman with an issue of blood. All she wanted to do was touch the hem of his garment. Jesus knew she was there. Jesus knew what she needed. She knows you're here. Hey, look, look. He knows you're here. He knows what you need. Zacchaeus thought he didn't want to have any type of uh, uh, amplification. He, he was climbing in a tree. Jesus knew he was there and called him by name. Is he calling you by name right now? Is your yes on the table? Let's pray, and then after we pray, we're going to stand. Bill's going to lead us in a time of invitation. And right now, for all of us in this room, so many things were spoken of. Say yes. We're going to pray. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. The, we're going to have some of the pastoral staff here at the front. You may just need somebody to pray with you. You may need to receive Jesus. You may need to say, I'm going to go through ba baptism. I'm going to go through the next steps of church membership. I'm going to start sharing Jesus with my neighbors. Some of us are here today. We got sons and daughters who are lost. We've got grandchildren who are lost. We got parents who are lost. We're just watching it. We're on the side of the bridge just watching it. It's time for us to risk everything for the cause of Christ. Father, only you can break our hearts. Only you can call us by name. I pray that every one of us understands this is not a social organization, that we're not here to compete against anyone else, that this is a mass hospital. We're waiting to meet with the great physician, and you're calling us by name. So, Father, at this moment, may this altar come alive. Lord, may this moment be the time when someone crosses from death into life. Show up and show off for your glory because you alone are worthy of it. Bless this invitation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.